the undercover immigrant though how did that idea come about mm. so we started tramp face uh which is one of my goal vent ventures of occupying myself in between the gaps in the marines me and paul we started every year we'd for a week of our annual leave go and live with the first one we're just going to live homeless for a week and we wanted to do it you did your ones brilliant as well a little bit different yours is quite serious and well documented we basically just got on the piss for a week <laughs> without <laughs> without going home <laughs> a week party yeah but we did it as in we weren't going around telling people that we weren't homeless and we were just playing around, dressed scruffily, told people we were ex-forces who'd been kicked out on the streets. Very believable story. And we want to immerse in it because we all walk past someone on the streets every day, begging, sleeping. But we don't, what do they do for the rest of the day? We don't know. We're like, well, let's go and find out. How do they get money? How do they get food? How are they treated by people? How do they find somewhere to live so the idea was let's go and do it fully immersed for a week we got a bag the overriding rule was we can't do anything that a homeless person um couldn't do couldn't use our own money couldn't get help from other people so we went when it did that for a week uh, at the end of it it was great we raised money for charity we felt a real connection with it i, I came off the streets wanting to go back it was like coming back from war it was like that was just such a refreshing. It was hard work, obviously, as you know, tiring. But it, it definitely, I felt a connection with it. Let's do it again next year. So each year we decided to go on up the ante because we were like, you can't, we can't just go and do the same thing again next year. People aren't going to give money for that. They like, did it last year. You already proved that. Let's, and for our own satisfaction, let's just up the ante and go a bit further. So second year then we did go to our first trip to the migrant camp. We went across to Calais. The goal that year was just to live there for a week and see if we could try and get back on one of the trucks. Didn't. It's got actually quite harder than uh, you thought. Hence why they're now coming across in the boats. Did that third year we hitchhiked around the UK whilst living homeless. So the same rules, but every day thumb out. Somebody picks us up wherever they were going. We jumped in and went. Like the first guy, where are you going, lads? Where are you going? Leeds. Leeds it is. Uh, did that for a week. Fourth one, we cycled Swansea to London over five days whilst living homeless. Two nights homeless in London and then ran the London Marathon on the last day after seven days homeless. We had a lull then after that year. We were like, how can we top that? Because it was great. It raised 10 grand for charity. How can we beat this? We have to go homeless on the moon or something. And then the boats came back into the news again, massively. There'd been a few incidents with it that got high, high level attention. And Paul was like, well, the last time we went there, we didn't achieve our goal of smuggling ourselves back to the UK. He's like, we've got to lay this to rest. Let's go back, but let's go via Paris this time. We'll go to a yellow vest protest to see what's going on there. Got gassed by the French police. Got that on video. This is my next YouTube video, actually. And then go back to the camp, see how it's changed. And then get across on a dinghy. Right, how are we going to get this dinghy? I'm not going to go and pay a human traffic, actual trafficker 20 grand to get across. So the plan was we'd go there, live for a week. And then our friend from back home would drive over in a van the night before with a deflated dinghy in the back. And he should have got rumbled coming across Dover to France with a dinghy in the back and a small engine, a lone bloke on his own. He didn't. Did the van get searched? Van didn't get searched. That's the fucking, that's one of the issues. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He could have brought anybody over. Yeah. Oh yeah. A van for starters. He's like, right, he's a van. He, yeah. There's not that many vans going across, I'm sure. Bloke on his own. Let's have a quick look in the back here. Because they he would have they would have stopped him hundred percent if they'd have opened that back door, <laughs> deflated in the engine like no chance, mate. Did they have an excuse if they asked? I don't know actually. I don't know. He probably because he's good. Yeah, he's a bit like you. Do he's got a gift yeah, of the gab yeah, and the white boy? He'd have come up. <laughs> he'd have come up with something to yeah. get out of it. <laughs> how did you then? So when you're with the migrants, because how does two white guys then fit in? Because obviously. Mm. 
English speaking, how do you fit in with two foreigners without being an undercover cop or undercover mm. journalist? How do you get away with yeah. that? This was the issue. When he Paul came up with the idea to go and the first time as well. So the first time I was like, well, what's going to be the story? In the UK, it's easy to be pretend to be homeless. How are we going to pull this off? We can't pretend to be on the run from Eritrea, right? Or Syria. The story was, and when he first said it to me, I was like, this is bonkers, but actually very believable and probably the only thing that would have been believable. Story was, we joined the French Foreign Legion, which, of course, then you have your documents taken off you, passport, getting your identity in the Legion. We didn't like it. That went for us. We jumped the wall, wandered out of the Legion, but because we haven't got any documents, we want to get back to the UK. Well, we can't travel now legally because we can't prove who we are. So we're making our way back towards the border, trying to get word to the UK government of who we are until they can process it, send some sort of documentation for us to get back across. So until that time period, we're living homeless uh, on, North, on in the camps in Northern France uh, until we get that. And we didn't only roll that out to the migrants that we were living with because we went and lived in their camps, slept in the tents with them, slept on a church doorstep with a lot of Syrian guys. But also there's a lot of people in these camps, officials, reporters, police, all the, the charity and NGO agencies are like, we're going to keep up. We're going to have to keep up the pretense to them as well. <laughs> so we were rolling the story out to them as well. And they believed it. Silly bastards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what would have happened though, if they didn't, if they had suspicion that you were police, could your life be in danger? I mean, they did. They did have suspicion. Some people just directly said to us, I don't believe mostly the NGOs, believe it or not were very suspicious towards us. The migrants, I mean, even if we were undercover, what apart from getting where they're going to get facilitated, what are we going to get off them when they're just sat around in the camp? Nothing, because they're not really doing anything at that point. But a lot of the people who wanted to help them, they, their, their levels were up. They're like, oh, these guys, they're suspicious. And we don't trust them. And we, they didn't want us interfering in the help they're giving them to get across the channel. Because a lot of agencies out there, their goal is to overtly help migrants to get across the channel. There's one called No Borders. And their, their mission statement is, we believe there should be no borders in the world. And we will help everybody go wherever they want. And these people are in the camp. They, they provide them information. They provide the connections. And they actually smuggle them as well. It, we didn't see this in person, but conversations of other people in the camp, they put them in their cars and take them across. So these organizations were very suspicious of us. We did employ a couple of countermeasures, Paul and I being military, whereas if we thought the occupants were being a bit suspicious towards us, because this was serious. I was still serving in the Royal Marines at the time. If they'd got wind of who I was, somehow... Because we were, we did the first one. We did say on Facebook where we were going. We had the charity page for it. Then they're from Syria and these countries. They're gonna have an easy access to terrorist organisations. That's a very simple phone call. Is a British Royal Marine sleeping in our camp tonight? How much do you want for us to hand him over? Or whatever the deal. So it was really serious situation, and we had to be. Uh, on our guard about so every now and again we'd put in some countermeasures paul would say oh, i'm hungry i'm going to go and get something from the supermarket he'd go off obviously be watching if somebody was following him i'd be watching the camp to see if someone did leave someone would a couple of minutes later they'd have a phone call or because they all got phones and then when he got back later that night when we were on we'd have a conversation he was like oh yeah Assad was i saw him when i come out of the the supermarket or whatever. So we had to be on our guard as well when conversations were breaking out in languages that we didn't speak. And they were getting quite heated. And we're like, well, are they arguing about us? I think think they're talking about us and one of them's not happy with us being here. So there was a lot of tension at all times for our, for our own safety. So see, because they're there, are they basically trying to get to the UK or they're living there? Surely, they, why is it not? No, they're getting to the UK. 
but if people know that, then why is people not interview? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just, and this is that's the question. How many people were there? What, on the first trip, two thousand people in two those. Thousand, so this yeah. was called the Cali Jungle, is that correct? But it, it stopped was, in 2016, it, 2017. Moved, we the first trip, they actually cleared out the original jungle. It was a woodland near a gymnasium. But it wasn't just that. That was just one small woodland. There was so there was a camp in the dune area. There, and then there was just small satellite camps everywhere. One by church, which we slept with with the guys. A lot of people look at it and they think there's one big camp there and they're all singing songs on the campfire and they're all friends and mates and, and united in their gold here across the channel. There's not. There's camp from Eritrea, camp from Syria, camp from Afghanistan, camp from Sudan. All these different satellite camps and they don't like each other. They're not working together. They're all competing because, they, as you said, they're not there to live in that camp for the rest of their lives. The goal is to get across the channel. And with the second trip there, we went to Paris as well, and we saw staging post in Paris. We went to one on the outskirts called Paul La Chapelle is the area. And we spoke to people again, we just went up, they're on fires, chatting with them, and they were getting their food handouts. What's the score, lads? Why? And not just as reporters, just hanging around first. Don't ask, not asking direct questions, just chatting with them. And eventually the stories would come out. The one in Paris was a staging post. They, they had no intention of staying in Paris either, but they'd come from Southern Europe. And of course, same as any movement or migration, you can't you do it in one fell swoop if it's over that distance. So Paris was a staging post. We're here, we're here to stay, take stock, meet up with the next agent or facilitator, and then move on to Northern France. So all the ones in that camp, at the time, 2,000 of them. Their goal was to get across the channel. A lot of them, they end up, there for months and months, they run out of money, run out of options, and then they do hand themselves in. But it's a good question: is like, why isn't somebody going in and yeah, doing something about that, yeah. it? They just left there. The, the French police will just they just sit on the outskirts of the camps. They don't go. They don't go in there on a daily basis. Are they happy for them to leave France though and go to the UK? Well, are, are they being pushed yeah. towards the UK in a way? That's one question, and it's got to be a big. Suspicion, isn't it? Why aren't they going into the camps to do something? Are they just happy for them to be off their doorstep? They're not our problem anymore. They're going across the channel. Why aren't they doing more to stop them on the beat launching? Because you look at, go on Google Maps and look where we launched to come across the channel. We, we surveyed it from Google Maps. We didn't go there and look at where we were launching. We were like in the camps going, right, where are we going to go from? We went on Maps. There was one obvious prominent slipway in to the channel closest to the camp. Well, that's the easiest one to get to, and it's the closest actual route then to southern England. So it's not hard to work out certain launch points. And I think that on myself, I'm like, why, how are they still able to launch? They surely exhausted all the secret places that they've got, because it's been going on for over a decade. Why aren't these places, you don't have to have somebody stood there, you set up a camera, a live CCTV camera, wired back into the local police station. Two guys who just turned up with a, with a fast boat and there's another 50 guys on their way. Right, let's get down there and, and nick them. Was there any women or kids in these camps? So two, and one of them had a, a baby with her. So I don't think she was living in there, but out of the couple of thousand men, that was it. They weren't, they weren't women in there. Was there any fights? Yeah, the Kurdish and the Syrians hated each other, so they'd they'd be fighting during the day. It was really benign. There's loads of people walking around there in the day. Medical staff and the other people I mentioned. They're all drinking in the camps, and I got photos and videos of the mess of these, and I sat around the campfire with them drinking. And in any environment where you put a lot of young men, darkness comes in, they're all having a few beers. There's drugs as well. We definitely saw the evidence of drug taking. Things are going to spill over. And there would be arguments, fights between the camps. Paul and I would then, if it happened when we were there, extract ourselves because we don't want to be stuck in the middle of this. Um, but it surprised a lot of people because they think, it's just one big harmonious camp. 
they're all mates and together and it's the opposite they're all fighting with each other and in competition this is the issue though young men drinking it's not women and children mm. like you say as refugees who are want a safer life which is understandable these are young men mm. drinking fighting with each other mm. all get knives do you know what I mean? All tooled up. Mm. So, and coming into the borders, you don't know what they're capable of. Mm. And uh, this is a concerning thing with mm. most people are just concerned of the safety of their family. Yeah. And that's, and rightly so. Yeah. It's just... And what you got to be concerned about as well is how organised it is. Because again, a lot of people probably wouldn't realise this. They think, oh, they've just struggled and whatever to get to Northern France. And they're well-funded. A lot of guys well-dressed. And again, we got photos of them, mobile phones, and there's economies in these camps. There were little convenience stores built up, built with like crates, the little flag on top. When we go to the Aldi or Lidl, Paul and me, to get our few cans of lager, because we, we were Dutch courage and to blend in with them, they're like, would, would a couple of undercover guys be sat here having a couple of beers with us? They'd be there with trolleys, stacked high, full of cans of lager, a couple of guys. Like, well, he's not buying that for himself, is he? A trolley full of beer they're going back and then selling it to the other guys and we just that opened our eyes we didn't think we were going to see that we thought we we're just going to see people just scrambling to survive not buying things off each other was there any of them coming for a better life genuinely a better life or was it just a kamikaze job to come to the uk there was and you got to be like i like to do you got to be honest and look at these without any bias or emotion and there were guys we spoke to and you do think because it does humanize it when you look at it from afar doesn't matter who you are you're from afar and when you go there and talk to him and of course he this is the personal interaction then you do get humanized towards it and there's a few guys who think do you know what you you really well spoken and educated told us that they had qualifications back home and you're like you would actually be a benefit to the country in some ways but you can't do it this way, mate. There's a way to do it. And there will have been people in these camps that could have come here and got a job and done things correctly. But the fact that you're not doing that and you're doing it by devious methods says something on its own. So you could really be well-educated and you could live a life in our society. But also it says something about your character that you're willing to do it illegally. Yeah, they're committing crime. So if you're willing to do it in that, in that instance, at the start, what could that turn into with influence the other end and offers of money? You get, yeah, you can't get a job. All right, yeah, well, you can come and do this for your cousin who used to know you back home. So, yeah, I have to be honest and say we did make friends with some of them and you think, yeah, you you actually seem like a pretty decent guy. Yeah, but that's But you good. also got a question. Yeah, of course, the method of being an illegal immigrant, no papers, no passport, you're coming into the country with be mm. criminals straight away. Mm. What is the consequences if they get caught, say, on the middle of the ocean? Like, mm. what is the consequences? Where do they go? Are they getting took to the UK? Yeah. Are they getting took to France? What's the mm. consequences? It's gone back and forth because keeping up with it myself for the last few years. There's been instances where I think they were saying, oh, the French are now turning them around if they catch them up to a certain point. There's another point where I was saying, like the French, once they leave, they leave the coast, that's it. They're your problem, whatever they're picked up from, or if the British border force pick them up, even if it's 100 metres off the French coast, tough. The British have got them. That's their problem. And it's an interesting one, because I don't actually know what, the, the law is on it I think we somebody needs to come out from the government and tell us because one minute it's oh the French will take them back the next minute is oh no they won't well what is is it a human rights law that's stopping us sending them back if we catch them so far along is it a, a just our own law which prevents it in which case we could change that it's our law I don't actually know what the the official ruling is on it and it is a mess in it because like I said, it, we'll pick them up and then, well, we'll take them all the way. Yeah. The stories of us getting picked up closer to France than the UK, but we bring them across and then they get processed. But it's a lot of the families who are struggling and they're getting put up in the fancy hotels, having their food paid, they've got the mm. best of clothes, the best of technology. Mm. 
There was so many people struggling yeah. here. So it made me laugh was that Bibby Stockholm. Um, you know, the the prison ship or whatever they called it. I don't think it was a prison ship. It was, it was an old, mm. like, oil workers accommodation ship. They called it a prison ship. And you see the pictures of it, that. You're like, you've seen the shittles that I had to live in for 17 years in the Marines. I know it, my room as a sergeant, a sergeant in the Royal Marines in the sergeant's mess, you couldn't drink the tap water. And I'm not making that up. There's a sign on there saying non portable. <laughs> Are you a bit pissing green? Yeah. To get a glass of water, as a sergeant in the Royal Marines, to get a glass of water, I had to walk all the way down the corridor, I know, oh, first world problems, to the uh, laundry utility room to get a glass of water. And you're thinking, sergeant in the Royal Marines can't drink the water from his own tap. That place was luxury compared to some of the, some of the shittles you stay in, in like the Welsh mountains. I think it was the same down in, they put him in Penali camp, which is down in West Wales. And they kicked off about that. And then the human rights lawyers get involved. And I'm like, why? And then the government cave, of course, as soon as the human rights lawyers get involved. Oh, yeah, okay. okay. And they moved them. Yeah, it's good enough for our forces and our troops. Why isn't somebody in the government go standing up and going, we put our Royal Marines in these places, so therefore they're fit for um, for humans. And they, they put one in near Folkestone. I think it might have been Napier Barracks or one of them. And they burnt it down. They, they set fire to it because they didn't like living there. It was an army camp. So it's what is the numbers, the actual numbers of immigrants coming to the UK daily, weekly, monthly, yearly? Do you know? No, I don't. I don't. I know there's a report this week said I think 500 had turned up in one day, which that is staggering. Like we come across on, on one, me and Paul on one boat, so you could say, all right, we slipped through the dis the defences. You can't really have a go a border force for that for every single. You can't expect them to catch every single boat, but 500. That seems like there's no defense at all. And they're not coming out and going, oh, oh, 500 got across, but we caught 300. You just hear 500 got across. 500 boats? Yeah, so did what? Did 500? No, 500 people. Did 500 people set off and get and achieve it? Or, yeah, so, I mean, I don't think anybody really knows the numbers because when we, when we came across, we... Five minutes before we landed, two actual boats had landed and they'd caught them, but they were trying to run away. So we know about the numbers that are getting caught and processed, but how many boats are hitting? Because a lot of them don't want to be processed. They want to go and live illegally in whatever and work in a car wash or uh, whatever they do. I don't know. How many are, are getting across, hitting the beach, legging it uh, that we don't know about? Yeah. Well, we don't know. But if you're living illegally somewhere, you can do what the fuck you want. You can do any crime and then fuck mm. back off. Mm. It's scary. And because um, obviously your videos where we see all the rats running about this camp. Yeah. Fucking disgusting. Yeah. And the rubbish. Yeah. And that, uh, that was self. Um, I think sort of saying in the video, we turned up at this camp. They're all getting fed from the, the charity agencies. And looking at it just from a completely neutral point of view, was the attitude they'd get these little foil trails trays with the like chow mein or whatever food the rice they've been given and i'd watch some of them and they'd take a, a few spoonfuls and just throw it on the floor now there were wheelie bins there provided and because the government the council knew this was a camp now so they try as best they can to facilitate it with bins and all the rest of it there were bins everywhere and they just throw it on the floor, like at the rats. It was as if me and Paul made a, made a joke. It was like their pets, because they'd have a few spoonfuls and then just discard it. And like, well, I don't, anyone on earth, I don't understand that mentality. It's like, if you're living there why, and there's rats everywhere, why would you feed the rats? Is it because it's a staging post? And they don't care because they're out of there in maybe in a day or two's time. Yeah, but if they're doing that, they'll be doing that anywhere. And that's that's one exactly of the, the point is when you you look at someone's behaviours, it's if they're doing that there, then mm -hmm. that's just the way they are. It's not it's probably not a one off that they've that they're just doing that. So what was your plan going back then? Having your friend drive with the dinghy and then finding a location and then just bringing the dinghy, dinghy straight back to the UK? Did you yeah. have to check? Where did you have to check? Obviously, the dinghy was supported. Obviously, if there's two years in it, if you get a hole in that, you're dead. Yeah. 
Like, what was what was the plan behind that? The uh, the plan was pretty chip shop, if I'm honest with you. Kamikaze. Well, it was, yeah. And there was a reason for that as well. We didn't want to. We didn't want to go across there. Have some military precision, perfectly planned and executed thing to get across because we wanted to prove the point that we could get across with very little behind us. If it had been all well set up and everything, we'd have got across, gone, oh, look what we've done. And the answer would have been, yeah, of course you did. You're a Royal Marine. You had this in place. You had that in place. You had support. So it was purposely set up to be not well planned. <laughs> I think, Paul, we would have looked at that. I can't remember purposely doing it, but we would have looked at the weather just out of curiosity even. But it wasn't a case of, oh, if it's doing this, we're going to abort it. We were coming across on that night. All right, if it was a tropical storm but somehow come up from the equator and smashed it we'd have reassessed but it was a case of this is the night we're doing it it wasn't oh we could push it to the side paul had to go back to work i had to go back no i was flying to america to see my daughter the day after i didn't make that flight so it was purposely not well planned nikki came and met us and it was common he's one of the funniest guys i've ever met and we should have known by picking him that it would that it would have ended up like this. He turned up two hours late, obviously. Paul and I had been resting in a cemetery uh, before the off. He turned up two hours late. We jumped in, and he was dressed in uh, a stripy red and white shirt with a big tash and a French beret on for a bit of his grip bit of morale after all the time we'd had living in the camp for a week. Where's Wally? Yeah, uh, yeah, like the Where's Wally thing. Brilliant. So I was great bit of morale. Jumped in, he, and he said, right, I gotta find petrol station, lads. All right, Paul was like, "This is midnight now in rural France." Paul's like, "Have you not got enough fuel to get back to the port? It's not that far away, and there's petrol stations everywhere because it's a trucker port." Oh, not for the van, for the boat. Paul said, "You haven't brought any fuel for the boat." No, no, I'd, uh, we'll get some now. Where are we gonna find a petrol station in rural France this time of night? Found one. So he opens the light door. He's like, right, chuck us the yeah, two tanks. Chuck us the tanks, lads. So Paul goes to hand them to him. He goes, oh, hang on, Nicky. This one's full, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's full of diesel. Uh, Paul's like, all right. The boat engine's diesel, is it? No, petrol. I'm going to pour that one into my van and then fill it up with petrol. So Paul's like, right on, right on. So he fills one up with petrol and then he hasn't got a funnel to pour this. It's just a like a, a, a squat jerry can with a cap. He hasn't got a funnel to pour it into the van. So I had to cut the bottom of my water bottle off, turn it upside down, and Paul's just going, it's again. he's going up to the woman at the counter, going, are you a funnel? And she's like, well, she speaks French. He's going, le funnel. <laughs> <laughs> so I filled up the van, and Paul's going, right, Nikki, how far will one of these tanks get us? No idea. He said, what, what do you mean, no idea? I thought you were going to take the boat out last weekend to test how far you could get on a tank. Yeah, I didn't have time. Right, or if that one runs out in the middle of the ocean, it had, um, it's, it's, there's like a pipe that connects straight to the, the tank. Paul's like, has the other one got the same connection where we can just change the thing over? No, you've got to unconnect it, pour the other tank into that one, and then reconnect it. So Paul's like, what, bobbing around in the English Channel, we're going to be <laughs> trying to pour this petrol tank into the other one. Yeah. So it was, it was Paul at this point was just like, I'm going to cancel. Let's just call this off because it was all going wrong. Got to the slipway into the ocean, pitch black, and we had to pump the, the dinghy up. We had to do it from 12-volt battery from the van and the noise. I got a video of the racket. I mean, it's like a pneumatic drill going off. You're like, how somebody didn't get alerted? and come and get us. Well, it says the police in it, they probably would have gone, yeah, don't worry about that. If they did, they get the call. Pumped it up, and then we had to drag it all the way down this beach um, to the shore. Did a little video. We had a blow-up doll with us, um, which Nicky brought with us. So we, we knew he was bringing a blow-up doll, but we didn't know that he'd sell a tipped a face to it. If you remember Only Fools and Horses, is the episode where they inadvertently bring back a stowaway from Calais called Gary. So he'd sell a tip Gary's face to this blow-up doll, so he was going to be our, our stowaway for the, for the journey. And that was it. Um, 
got prepared on the slipway. Uh, we didn't even have a bearing for England. We just, like I said, we wanted it to be just loose. It's that direction, north. Let's go. Pumped it up, jumped in with Gary, and uh, off we went, set towards England. What's the distance? 22 miles, I think. And how fast does a boat go? I don't know, but it took us four and a half hours. So any mathematicians out there, 22 miles. And we, we wouldn't have gone in a straight line either because we didn't have a, a, like a bearing. We'd have been, there were ships around the coast as well. So we had to avoid swells and avoid. Yeah, what about the Shatton Lane? Because that's one of the busiest in the world. Yeah. How do you, because it's pitch black, they might not have seen you. Pitch, so yeah. how do you judge that? Do even you, Even in the light, they'd see us a lot sooner, I guess, but they're massive. Are they looking around for little dinghies to, to avoid? They don't care. The big tankers flying down the English Channel, all it really cares about is the direction it's going. So even if they would have seen us at the last minute, we're tiny in this in these swells, they, they can't change course. And it's probably more dangerous for them to try and do a, a, a hard left or hard right. So it was the onus was on us. We've got to keep a lookout for them. If it's too late, they're not moving and we're not getting away from them. So it was constantly, as soon as we set off, pitch black when we set off. So trying to gauge the lights. And it's hard to gauge the the perception of how far away they were. When we did see a light, we're like, well, how big is that light? If we don't know how big the light is, we can't judge how far away it is either. So it was a few times where it started getting bigger and we're like, shit, that's pretty close now and we'd have to... It's a lot easier for us to to change direction and change around. And we were more concerned about border force boats, not for getting in trouble, because we we hadn't broken the law. We'd broken rules because technically I still haven't left France from from that trip because we flew in on our passports, but we didn't check out, of course. So we'd break, we'd broken rules, as in we should have checked it, checked out of France, and we should have checked in with a harbour when we got to the UK. We didn't, but it was more of a concern of us not being able to do it. It was, we wanted to achieve this, this goal. We'd been building up all week for it. So it'd have been a nightmare if we'd set off and half an hour later, the border force had picked us up and, and we'd failed then. So that was, that was a big concern as well. 22 mile though. Yeah. It's not that far for people to come through your borders hmm. either. So see, when you're getting to the end, were you just more concerned of border patrol when there was none? Yeah. None whatsoever? None. We, the only border, we could, might have seen one in the dark. Of course, we couldn't identify them. But why the fuck would they not do runs of every half hour, every hour, mm. just to kind of, yeah. it's like they're, everybody's welcome and it doesn't matter who it is, which mm. is fucking madness because it wouldn't be that expensive to put people on the shores or on boats mm. to just, yeah. it's not a big it's not a big vicinity to mm. then mm. not be looking at, like you say, CCTV, pretty basic, mm. or uh, something with sensors. To, there must be. You must have been on. Were you been on the radar? Mm. You must have been yeah. on the radar, yeah. Eh? yeah, yeah. And like looking from a, from a military point of view, is if say that was we were at war with somebody, could say we are on the coast of northern France, and the way they were attacking us was to send boats across. If you put the British military in charge of stopping that, that'd get stopped in a day. You'd have reconnaissance teams on the ground watching them. You'd identify where they could. You'd have drones, satellite imagery. You'd get all the intercept their communications. We can do it in Baghdad and, and Helmand province to a massively high level and effect. Very uh, effective and successful at it. So if that was the British military doing it, when we're doing it on such a level with global terrorist organizations, that'd be stamped out. But why? Why isn't it? Why isn't it? Is it because we're not coordinating with the French? Is it because the French don't want to coordinate with us? Or whether maybe our government don't want to coordinate with the French? There's got to be something stopping it because in, if you look at it from the practical point of view, like I've said in the military, that is a very basic operation to identify and stop at its source right there. So how easy would it be to stop the boats? Just like you say there, that's how easy it would be to just drones, military, it could be stopped in a day. Yeah, you'd identify where they're coming from and not just from where they're launching from. That 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 logistics route goes back a long way. 
But that I tells mean, you're you that at Turkey and I mean places like that. As but well. that tells you that nobody wants them stopped. Yeah, it's clear cut evidence that nobody wants them stopped. Someone is benefiting from this. Yeah, and like we always say, the, the old divide and conquer. You don't really look at the bigger picture and the real enemy mm. is the ones who are making the money behind that with the destruction, the pain, fighting and arguing and riots. Mm. People are then easy to control. They can then change the laws. Okay, we can't really get you, but we'll change this law. And we can do you from take away your freedom of speech mm. and uh, just everybody shut up and let us deal with what we're dealing with. But people have just had enough. Mm. Did you find it easy then to get into the UK? Was there any moments you thought, fuck me, this is a bit dodgy? On the on the route over? Yeah. It was dodgy as in like, because yeah. we were on a channel bobbing around on a boat. But at no point did, did we come close to getting caught. The only two Border Force boats we saw, and I got a video of it, was as we approached the coast we saw two of them flying across our front and i actually say on the camera i think it's the border force and it was that was for the two actual boats who'd already landed ahead of us just further down the coast so we, we weren't the only ones out on this channel and they'd only come flying down to intercept them once somebody had seen them on on the beach or probably seen them mm -hmm. approaching they that was the only so they weren't even there for you no, they weren't there for us, and we got arrested eventually. <laughs> but it wasn't until after an hour later, because the practical reasons were, if we were one of those other boats or actual migrants, as soon as we hit that beach, we're either legging it or going and handing ourselves in. Whatever your preferred option is of what you want to happen afterwards, that's what you do immediately. Of course, we didn't have that option because we had our mate's boat to deflate, and the engine and all our kit. And he was driving back over. So he came back across on the ferry. He couldn't get down to the beach because it was a pedestrian promenade. So he had to wait up the top, he borrowed a council landscaper's wheelbarrow to come and do shuttle runs up and down to the van. We were there for over an hour in broad daylight by this point before single police man turned up. So we'd have been actual migrants. We, we could have done whatever we wanted gone um into the wild or hand ourselves in so the fact that and we were by folkestone harbour right in the mixer now you could see we could see as we're coming in I, i'm on the camera saying there's dover port off just to our side we're, we're not sneaking in up when somewhere up near um east anglia or somewhere where they're not looking we're down the, the throat of it and it took over an hour for somebody to come and see what was going on um so yeah, the defences are pretty, they're pretty weak there. What did the corporal say to you? It was quite funny because <laughs> you could we, have been, you could have been a human trafficker, a drug trafficker. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah, and they didn't swoop because it was waves. First of all, it was a couple of bobbies mm -hmm. just coming and going. What are you up to, lads? And we were messing around with them because at this point, as I said, we we had a passport on us. We haven't broken the law, and we're not actually smuggling people apart from Gary the dog. <laughs> um, so we're we're pissing about with the coppers to get more of a story out of this and have a laugh. What are you up to, lads? Oh, we're just out for the day on the boat. And they obviously picked up in the Welsh accents. What, from fucking Wales? They were like, yeah, we've got to be lost, mate. And that went on for a bit, questioning us, questioning us. And looking back at it now, it's like two blokes have just turned up on a little dinghy unannounced without a good story. Somebody should have swooped other than the bobbies, straight away. We were on there for an hour of different waves of people. First, it was a couple of bobbies, and it was, I think, Border Force or Customs turned up. Eventually, the National Crime Agency. But it weren't, uh, it weren't uh, a swift operation to detain us. Uh, so we, we were messing around, and it's quite funny. My mate dressed up as uh, Where's Wally, the Frenchman, whatever. He was doing a wheelbarrow, little run past us and the cop are obviously just wondering what's going on so he looks over and sees him and he goes to us is he with you and we're like he shouts over oi and nicky just turns and goes sorry i speak another the english and we're just like this is going south pretty quickly um yeah so bobby's and National Crime Agency, and eventually they turned up. And what we didn't know at this point, hence why we were messing around with them, was the other two boats that had been 
commandeered. The two drivers, and this is this shocked me then, and it still does now. The two drivers were ex British military. So of course they question me, Royal Marine, you're in cahoots with them, you're like the decoy boat, or you have brought someone and they've legged it already. So the two drivers of those boats were and I don't know how that would have come about, whether they are working for the criminal gangs and there's good money in it. They used to drive boats for the Marines or the army. Now they're earning a bit of coin over in France for it, or whether they've got disillusioned with the military, the UK as a general, they've gone completely the other way. And now they're working for these NGO groups who just want to smuggle people over for their own, so their own needs. We yeah, don't know. It's madness.